All right. Very well then. We'll get started. Many of you, are, uh, I wish to thank for being here this afternoon. I know your time is precious, and I promise you something completely different um, in terms of um, technology, something completely new. In any case, I would like you, for those of you who have experience in the database world and in the data warehouse world, as well as Excel, uh, to kind of put that those concepts aside for a little while um, and open your mind to a completely new way of approaching data and uh, storing, retrieving, uh, and building applications. That being said, um, move on. A little bit of an introduction. Virtudesk basically is a software development firm. We specialize in state-of-the-art technologies. Our three main areas are data warehousing, compliance, business intelligence. Presently, we're bringing to market all three of these services based on a new technology, uh, technically an older theory technology, but basically brand new to the market, about a year old. The world as you know it is on the left, two-dimensional. It's an unnatural state of mind for the human being. Um, basically, at the bottom left, you'll see the database world as everyone has known it for the last 50 years. Squares, rectangles, connections, one spreadsheet or essentially a bunch of spreadsheets one to the other or a bunch of tables one to the other to try to formulate some form of storage and retrieval system for information. It's unnatural to the human being. The real world that you and I and everyone else lives in is on the right. It's n-dimensional, n-possibilities Everything is changing every minute, dynamic, uh, modifies, uh, inserts, deletes, changes in, in association. Essentially the bottom picture, bottom right picture is what you will, is what we are proposing to you as an alternative. Which is why I go back to saying, open your mind. The world that we've been living in is on the left, the one we're proposing is on the right. As an analogy. Our own language, the English language, or any other language for that matter, is nothing more than an, un an unlimited combination of symbols, basically 26 in the alphabet, and when you include numbers, characters, you wind up with about 255. Out of these symbols, or combination of these symbols, or associations of these symbols, we create everything that we know in our civilization. Science, literature, economics, medicine, theater, politics, war, and yes, even technology. How is that possible? Well, the answer is very simple. It's association. As an example, if we take the letter F, in and of itself, it means absolutely nothing. The letter I means nothing. The letter R means nothing. The letter E means nothing. But when we associate them in a specific order, we create fire. We create information. We create meaning. We create context. If we remove the letter F from fire, we get ire. Again, an entirely different meaning and context. Could mean anger, could mean abbreviation for Ireland. Again, context. Out of these symbols we're able to create anything that we wish and store anything that we wish, describe anything that we wish. This is how our database slash information system works. We have no restrictions because we are at the atomic level in terms of data. No restrictions. This is, again, a, a graphical image depicting exactly what I'm saying is our entire civilization is based on this character chart and another one like it. Our database is basically built on that concept. So as you can see, it has nothing to do with rows and tables and columns. Now, it's been 50 years since uh, Ed Codd or Dr. Codd announced his famous 12 rules on how to store data in a two-dimensional tables and gave birth to the relational database. In the last 50 years, everything has changed. Uh, we've been to the moon, cars, technology, medicine, but we're still using the same 50-year-old rules to store data in day-to-day -day life and retrieve. Finally, someone had come up with the technology, which we're going to describe today, that captures information in a context, creates relationships the way you want, the way an organization wants, the way that makes sense, and at an appropriate speed. 
but there's that's not all that's new in this technology. The other capabilities are the ability to change and evolve the system on the fly. I don't have to redesign the system from scratch every time I make a column change, a field change, a program change. I can make a modification and it continues to function. That's the nature of an atomic system. The ability to connect organically with any other system. Again, built with the same system or other systems. Solves them solving the warehouse problem. I can connect to SQL as well as Access, Excel, uh, anywhere you wish. The ability to store and transmit information at a much higher level of security. Since our system is built on single instance storage, and we are the only one on the planet that uses single instance storage for any piece of data. As an example, the word John, even if I have 14 John Smiths in the database, I will only have John once. He will simply be associated to Smith. 14 times, or there will be one Smith and there will be 14 associations with another record distinguishing them. There will never be more than one John, never be more than one Smith in our system, no matter how large the system grows. Well, these are the 12 rules. Uh, I'm not going to go through them, obviously, because, I mean, you understand the complexity involved. Now, this is a testament to the ingenuity of the computer scientists, uh, theoreticians, mathematicians, all attempting to solve the problem, which uh, Ron, Ron Everett has solved. Uh, as you can see from the beginning, we've had the flat file system, document-oriented, graph-based databases, column-oriented, in-memory, horizontal, you know, Amazon has a Dynamo online. Again, Hadoop with its HDFS is essentially a file system distributed. The queries required to build any of these uh, solutions is extensive, very complicated, and very expensive. And the hardware alone um, makes the price dramatically difficult to, to swallow. But again, all of these solutions are, in essence, solutions to symptoms. They are not solutions to the problem. Since this is about data warehousing, uh, this is an actual data warehouse slide and what's involved in building a data warehouse with using traditional tools. On the left, you'll see uh, all of the transactional data. Well, you'll see the, the, the index of the transactional data, data transformation. So because it comes from various sources, we have to transform that data to accommodate what the data house, warehouse will accept. On the right, you'll see all of the processes uh, designed to do that transformation and then allow it to be presented to the bottom level, the data miners, the OLAP users, tactical users, strategic users. As you can see, it's an extremely convoluted process, extremely complicated. And to be quite honest, half the time requires a PhD just to understand it. Um, this is not practical for business. It's not practical for end users we have a solution to this. Now this is the actual required results from an actual data warehouse project that we're actually working on. This is what our clients asked us for. Data resides on several disparate systems. Not a problem, we can, we can, we can uh, connect to that. Data standardization is poor, we can clean the data very quickly before we bring the data into the system. The master data is in several places, leading to multiple sources of reference, as well as redundant data maintenance. We are single instance storage. We do not have redundant data maintenance. We can actually clean it up. Heterogeneous system uses the same data in different formats. That's entirely possible. We can accommodate that as well. Uh, multiple applications use the same data sources, leading to redundant data. There is also no integration among various applications using these data sources. That Again, since we are single instance, since we are, uh, by definition, a data warehouse, we can alleviate these problems. Collecting and transforming data into a single source of storage. Again, we can, a single source of record. We can also accommodate that by default. The ability to locate data in a timely manner, because we have only four reads in our system, and we are a single instance, uh, the vector of performance on with us is several factors above anything that exists today. Too much information to be promised, to be processed, we basically extend to exabyte. 
and several times that depending on what the requirements is. Now exabyte for those of you who are not familiar is 1000 petabytes and each petabyte is 1000 terabytes. A single instance of our storage which I'll go into later um, supports this. How users interact with data analytics. This is difficult because every business entity, every business person has a different use for the data and requires the data in different forms or different uh, sizes of data. That being the case, we can accommodate, accommodate that since every single piece of data or column or uh, concept basically is atomic. So we can extract data from any point in the record. Lent, uh, the enterprise reporting, poor data quality, we accommodate this by default. We clean up the data before we enter it in and you can literally go in and check and verify that the data is accurate. We have no white space. We have no uh, orphaned records. We have no corrupted indexes. We have no corrupted data. It's either there or it's not. And we can see it immediately. Now the purpose of a project, uh, as can be clearly seen here, uh, is to translate or aggregate legacy transactional systems, re-engineer a new process into a data warehouse to create a portal to allow a single source of corporate information essentially. So everybody is talking about the same information. No two parties should have a different set of data, which is the case today in most corporations. That being said, we accommodate this easily quite honestly, and uh, by definition, our solution takes all of this into account. There is one major issue, and this is for the business people. Most of you uh, that have signed checks or have gone through this process for the last uh, 20 odd years, as you can see, what I call the big three, Microsoft, Oracle, IBM, DB2, uh, I should include a SAP here as well. Every few years, uh, you spend money, and that will not change moving forward. Uh, so in 2000, you built a system with Microsoft SQL Server. You invested X number of dollars to build this application. Come 2005, you have to start the whole process over again through data validation, process validation, user validation, et cetera, et cetera. And whether you use Oracle, IBM, SQL, or SAP, it's the same. You will continue to do this every year. Not so in our world, because we are atomic in nature. There is no upgrade cycle. Once you build a system, you can add to it at will. It does not break what you have already created. It does not de interfere with what you've already created. So your DROI here alone is stratospheric. Now, as you know, a little bit more graph, graphical comparison. On the top, you'll see basic data sources, Excel, Access, live feeds, could be video, could be data, could be social feeds, could be images. Uh, we, of course, have Oracle with its format, IBM with its format, SQL with its format, and, of course, EDI with its special format, and, of course, text files. Text files being the worst, considering there's kind of close to 100 versions of them, and those all have to be taken into consideration. Before they can be brought into the data warehouse at the bottom, they have to go through several um, transla translation, translation phases or transition phases in order to be brought into a format that can then be inserted into the data warehouse, which in and of itself is a difficult task to create and even more difficult task to extract data from. So if you make a single change to an Oracle source or to an access source, even to one into one row, one column, any one of those sources, your entire data warehouse has to be restructured. Your entire reporting structure has to be rebuilt. It's very, very static in nature. Not so in our world. We take the, the data directly into our system. So if I have budget, uh, a budget uh, field in Excel, and I have a budget field in Oracle, and a budget field in SQL, I aggregate them automatically into my budget field. If I wish to add another field from Microsoft SQL Server, say budget plus two, I can, and simply connect to it. Make it part of my warehouse. And it doesn't interfere with the existing system. 
again another version another uh, analogy here this is the world that we live in on the relational side and the world that we're proposing to you which is the object oriented side now the single largest problem for global business today is related to the ability to store and by definition retrieve useful information in massive volumes the existing technology just will not support it and every year we're increasing our data storage by some 30 to 40 percent most of it 80 percent of it is redundant data you're storing the same thing over and over and over again even with due to deduplication you're still storing up to 40 50 percent more than you need to data aggregation is yet another soreness the ability to grab data from multiple sources and make sense out of it you know just simply ask any CFO uh, to combine the monthly statement financial statements and uh, they'll cringe at the thought now getting back to this uh, relational structure on the bottom left here I'm going to go back keep this in mind this whole every square you see here green yellow blue all right is one of these relational structures can you imagine the complexity with us not so it doesn't matter now there are different types of warehouses uh, active data warehouse basically and they serve different purposes uh, strategic decision making tactical decision making and event based decision making those are the three basic ones there are, there are of course research uh, warehouses as well but for the most part business is is the reason for warehouses strategic being of course long-term decision making and those can, you know, you don't have too much of an issue with that uh, in terms of building them. Uh, they're very static in nature. Tactical, that becomes a different story. Now you have to make short-term decisions based on the information that's there. So your information has to be accurate, it has to be up to date, and it has to be able to be modified if necessary. Now the worst, which event-based decision making, that's instantaneous. Data warehouses today do an extremely poor job simply because they cannot be modified on the fly. You cannot make changes in a, in, in a, a clean enough amount of time or short enough amount of time to make good event-based decisions. We solve that problem. Right? And we also integrate data in such a way that it can either be event-based or batch-based, so synchronous or asynchronous. Uh, whatever is required by the client we can accommodate the data spans multiple subjects provides consistent view of the data objects yes we accomplish that by definition again a little bit more in depth on strategic decision making and tactical decision making uh, this is our world this is an actual product line that we're working with in compliance corporate governance system as you can see we this is in production today and as you can see on the left side is basically the application. That is the database for the application from the organizational model on down. On the right side would be the corporation and its corporate structure. The accountability must be, this is what we modify when we go to a client. This part here is already built. The product is already built around this. So we simply match or modify this area to accommodate whatever corporation so if it's Exxon or GE they have two different structures or if you have a Pfizer with three different divisions or a GE with 200 divisions uh, we accommodate each and every one of those in this area and we simply map it to this product again a little bit more of the difference here um, our approach this is the relational world that we live in today whether you're using SQL Hadoop uh, it doesn't matter you have a data radar, a data mart, data warehouse, SQL database, mainframe, file system, programming object. They all have to be brought into an aggregation system. And that has to be transferred to, standard, to a standard data warehouse. And then getting the data out of here for every business component or every business requirement, uh, research requirement, uh, client, sir, client requirement, customer requirement, um, is in and of itself extremely expensive and a very, very time-consuming task versus us. Since we aggregate it automatically, extracting data for us is a one, two, three process. Tell me what you want, what parts you want, and I present them to you. The data is already aggregated. We don't have to deal with it. 
So that allows us for reduced design time, reduced testing, reduced development, reduced deployment, and a much faster ROI. Now here's where it becomes extremely interesting for large organizations. Let's assume that we have a company that has some, uh, for example, I'll use GE. Um, they have some 200 divisions, each one of them with an HR system, each one of them with a financial system. There are efforts now to the tune of some $2 billion in the company to build multiple data warehouses and consolidate the systems into an HR system, into a financial system globally. It's very expensive, very time consuming. They're expecting to spend three years doing it. And now let's assume that they want to go a step further and combine these two data warehouses. Quite honestly, it's a, physical, it's a physically impossible task. Not going to happen today. With us, it will happen because, again, we can aggregate on the left, we can aggregate on the right automatically from multiple sources, and if we want to, we can combine both systems with a straight association. Not something that anyone else on this, uh, in this world actually can do. And how is that possible? Again, we go back to what amounts to, in computer science, a six normal form. It is intended to decompose relational variables into irreducible components. That basically means the way we store data is in its lowest common denominator form. You cannot get it smaller in a smaller form than we do. It's impossible. The entire system is built in assembler. We have single instance storage. We don't write the data more than once. We simply build an association index for it. One of the arguments here has always been the, the data vault. Is it in the six normal form? Without a column compression turned on, then no. The data vault contains repeating values and therefore breaks the rule. Now the interesting thing is we're not e uh, our system is not even in the six normal form. We are in the nth normal form. We actually supersede or are another dimension above the six normal form. Now many of the things you'll run into you know, are, are here, the column, I'm sorry, the columnar database, traditional RDB, uh, RDBMS, table stores. We have also had stories with document systems, um, star systems, all kinds of uh, concepts. Again, a credit to the imagination of the computer science community, but basically it is solving the symptom and not the problem. Our approach and by the way, I'm introducing you to our new platform. It's called Atomic DB for a very reason, for a very simple reason. We could not come up with a better moniker as it solves the problem. And it is small, it is fast, it is associative by nature. I can connect any atom to another atom and create a molecule. I can create, I can connect multiple molecules and create elements. Very simple here, exactly the same way. For us, we have two parts to our system. The environment is the overriding element. System is the underwriting physical structure. So we have the possibility of one to four billion systems, environments that is, and one to four billion systems. So four billion times four billion. That is uh, more than exabyte, obviously but we like to restrict it to one to exabyte because if we're going beyond exabyte then you're doing something wrong with the data. That serves as the physical process. Now what you will see here is the model, concept, and item. The model, the best analogy I can bring you to is a table. The concept is a field and the item is the actual item of entity, item of interest, the actual data itself. Consider the model a group of a group of a group and basically because we can access every piece of information with a single four key index, whether this is one or one billion or this is one in one billion or this is one in one billion or this is one in one billion, it doesn't matter. Because of the physical structure, I can split this data center from data center A to data center B or data center you know, B plus one billion. It actually does, it creates a local copy when both systems are connected. Automatically you have nothing to do here. So when I access the data first, it could be John, Jim, Thomas, it will be 1111, 1112, 1113. It's an abstract. This is essentially, an, uh, these, three, these three concepts or these three um, items here, objects, 
are essentially an abstract of the data that you're bringing into the system. Now, again, another view, another view of this, if I had a concept, a model called employee, I have a concept called first name, as you can see, John is there, Henry is there, I can associate them with uh, another concept called ID, it has an ID, maybe they have the same ID, why they wouldn't, I don't know. Um, we have a middle name James, uh, last name Smith, and we have a concept ID of a phone. We can associate things anywhere that we want with anything at will without breaking what we've already created. As far as capacity is concerned, for those of you who are not mathematical in nature or computer scientists, an exabyte is a very, very large number. To give you a concept on your computer, you probably have a uh, you know, 500 gigabyte drive or a terabyte drive in some cases. Uh, imagine a petabyte, which is 1,000 of what you have on your computer. Now, to give you a concept of how big a petabyte is uh, and how big uh, that amount of information is, Teradata, with all of the storage that it has on the planet, is 96 petabytes. With one installation, of our system, a single installation, we are 10 times that. Now if I took it to its absolute capacity at one gigabyte, at one billion objects, I am 10 to the 36 power of, of capacity. If I took it to four billion, which is its physical limits, it's in the hundreds. Size is not a limit, but as I said, if you are at this level, if you are at the exabyte level, you've done something wrong. Because the data, being single instance, should never reach exabyte. It really shouldn't. We only have one to 1 1.5 to the 19th power as possible combinations of symbols, as I said earlier in the English language, even if I included Chinese, Japanese, and Hindu languages. I still come out to 1.5 to the 19th power, which means I'm not even 1% of what the system can support if I took every possible combination on the planet. Now, development comparison. What we're talking about here is how we would build a data warehouse and what's required. Schema development design, by definition, of course, you have to create a schema and design. Schema mapping table layout, well, that we don't have to worry about because we don't have any queries. We don't have a table layout. And you'll see that later during the demo. Data integration and development, yes, we have to take care of that, same as they do. Uh, and the API or the class libraries, yes, we have that. Only ours has only six instructions. So the learning curve is very, very short. Now, all of the rest of this is standard for every data warehouse. Data encapsulation, materialized views, performance organization, table segmentation, metadata management, referential integrity checks, query evolution, configuration management. I don't have to do any of this. We do away with this because it's already built into the system. So everything that, you, that these processes are designed to do don't have any relevance anymore. And of course, the application user interface, yes, we have to do the programming on the front end. We don't take away everything, but a good portion of the back end is taken care of. Now what we've done here at the top is basically identify applications, the languages that they may be written in, the interfaces on the left here, SQL, DBC, JVBC, DAO, DAO, OS, and of course the data sources themselves. We connect all of them and we aggregate them all by definition through our API and our associative memory system. It doesn't matter to us what data you're pulling from one application from what data source. We bring it in, in a matter of a couple of seconds. Now again, this is a different graphic, but basically identifying the same thing. The whole purpose for creating a data warehouse, or any system for that matter, is the ability to come to a decision. That's the end goal. In that lens, we can pull data from data websites, database systems, mainframe systems, document management systems, XML systems, we absorb all of that as elements. Okay, We create analyst objects which essentially are the models that make sense to us and of course we have processes that run against those objects to create 
solutions or answers. Conditional, non-conditional, event-based, but essentially it brings you out a result and you can make a decision. Now imagine having that capacity 10 to the 18th, which as I said is actually considerably more if you push it, but it would be foolish because you shouldn't get to that point. Our API, as I said, only has six instructions. No more. This is the entire learning curve. You basically will be using, and one of them happens to be login. So uh, the other, the instruction you will be using most of the time, or the th uh, three instructions really, and, and possibly four. The get instruction is essentially equivalent to a query. It's get, pick out the model you want, the concept you want, the item you want, and return your information. It doesn't matter if you want it in groups, order, what order you want it in, across the entire spectrum of environments, entire spectrum of models, concepts, items, doesn't matter. The add instruction serves a similar function as you would see in the insert in SQL. The import instruction essentially is a batch instruction, allowing you to import massive amounts of data uh, as blocks of data as opposed to one, you know, one record at a time. The associate instruction allows you basically to uh, modify the associations, delete, add, uh, improve, uh, change permissions, etc. The modify is actually uh, similar in, nation, in, in structure to modifying the models, modifying the associations in, in a different way actually, at a higher level if you will. So as you can see, uh, the whole API for us is about 40 pages and it's, that's, that's including sample code not a very complicated uh, learning curve. What are the key benefits to the product, uh, to our products and services? Basically, we're at least 100 times faster than SQL and reads at the very minimum. And actually, when you use our PHP interface, several times that. Uh, we're at least 10 times faster on writes. Third, the disk store is based simply because we do single instance. So if I, I've actually myself taken a 10 terabyte database and brought it down to 2.9. Uh, simply by importing the data from one system to the other. As I said, there are no queries to write, there are no tables, no indexes, no views, no white space, no duplicates. So from a data cleansing perspective, you can identify what's wrong with your system. And since there are no orphan records, there's no white space, there's nothing for you to think that you're missing or you've lost, or you miswrote the query. It's either there or it's not. Now we have the ability to be case sensitive or not case sensitive. All right, we're, we're case insensitive by definition, but you can turn it on. We also are type agnostic. So you can enter any kind of form of data you wish. It's entered as zeros and ones in binary, as a blob. So if you want it to be case sensitive, the field to be case sensitive, it can be. If you want the item to be case sensitive, it can be. If you don't want it to be, it's not required. So I can enter video, I can enter documents, I can enter Excel spreadsheets, I can enter text files, anything in any form that you want, native, or I can typecast it. The interesting thing here is that very little support is required beyond uh, the installation of the system. Uh, no more, you know, for no more SQL guys, essentially. You don't need them uh, for that purpose. Instead, they can uh, be reassigned to more of an analytical uh, purpose without having to worry about the technology itself. Object-oriented design, by definition, it's an 80% reduction in development time. As I said, we have very limited uh, API. The interesting thing is you're going to repeat the same functions. If you had 1,000 pages, you're going to repeat the same three functions. So um, just pick, just change the variables. 50 to 75 percent reduction in development costs. That is our average, usually in the 50% uh, range uh, to accommodate uh, external systems. Only six instructions as you've seen. It's only one line of code to access your data. And you can associate anything with anything. So when your boss or your boss's boss asks you for a report, which uh, I myself had experience with business objects. I've had 10 business objects developers uh, working and uh, the lady I was working for had asked them for a report quantifying certain various, certain uh, aspects of their of these reports, combining them, etc. And they were, they all turned to her with a resounding no. 
it would take six months. Using this system, it took me six minutes. So um, now, one of the biggest issues here is this: is this a newfangled system? No. This is a system that's been around, a theory that's been around since the inception of the computer. The guys who designed and built the computer were smart enough to know that an associated model is what is the ultimate model in terms of data storage. But no one was able to actually build it in the digital world. Uh, no one actually was able to imagine it. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Ron, ha uh, Ron Ed uh, Everett, uh, former neurobiologist for NASA, in order to solve his problem with genomes, the human genome, actually created this system to solve that problem. And that was about 1995. And in 2000, it was brought to the United States Navy as a grant, and it spent 10 years in development and deployment with the Navy. It has only been released to the public in November of 2011. But as far as its uh, validity and as far as its verica verification, it's been extremely, extremely tested to the point where the NSA is now addressing it um, to solve their issue with data, which we know they have. As far as concurrent uh, connections, unlimited. As I said, in our the demo that we'll show, uh, there is uh, really no limit. Uh, whether it's Oracle, SQL, MySQL, flat files, it doesn't matter. Uh, and as I said, they can either be batch-based or event-based. Some metrics. Now, this is assuming a four-core Intel processor, one, and four gigs of RAM using a 5400 RPM disk, 500 gig drive. Just so we're clear, very, you know, most laptops are this. But in any case, this sets the calculation. A record with 50 columns of data represents 2,500 triples, if you include both directions, which we do. Because of every possible associative path is maintained, discovery of all associations is implicit from every data point, which means I can access every piece of information from any other piece of information, provided that they are associated. We assimilate a million records at 50 columns of data in typically less than 30 minutes. The best case when I ran it on my computer was 10 minutes. When I ran it on my laptop was 20. That's the equivalent of a million times 2,500 triples or 2.5 billion triples in 30 minutes. That's the worst case performance. For those of you who don't understand what that means, I'll work straight down to the end. The record today is 18,000 transactions per second. On a simple four process, uh, four core processor, four gigs, we were doing 30,000. And when we ran it on PHP, the number was astronomical. Since we don't store triples as triples, yet maintain the equivalent associative capability, we can get a huge advantage in performance, benefit over triple stores. The, that, what all of this means is essentially, instead of creating a structure to store data, which every other system on this planet does. The data for us is the structure. The actual data element itself is the structure, and we simply connect the structures as needed. That gives us an enormous amount of uh, advantage. Some practical examples. This is a healthcare, in the healthcare area. Uh, without sounding ridiculous, uh, the concept of Obamacare is physically impossible using present systems unless they use ours. And there, there, there is absolutely no way they can maintain that storage capacity or integration uh, using existing technology. Uh, as an example, if patient one up here is affiliated with hospital one and caregiver one and specialist one, that's a medical record. It is stored in its EPIC EMR, uh, EPIC being an uh, electronic medical record. However, if patient number one decides to go to hospital number three, let's say you know, he's an addict and he needs what, Oxycontin, whatever the situation is, and he's sick and this caregiver assigns him a prescription. If patient number one's a bad guy and he goes to hospital number three, he's going to be diagnosed the same way and he's going to be given the same medication. We can solve that problem. Okay? 
simply because we can aggregate the data from all three systems. And I've actually done this myself as, an, as a sample for um, uh, Long Island Jewish about a month ago. We aggregated these three systems. This is where this diagram comes from. And we actually presented a view to the doctors. So if he's a pediatrician, he gets to see the pediatric parts that he wants to see of the system. If he's a cardiologist, he can create his view and the parts that apply to him. If he's, he has to, if he's an octogenarian, he, I'm sorry, an um, oncologist, he gets to see things that are interesting to him. He doesn't want to see pediatrician data. We can accomplish that. And no other system really can. That's just one practical application of this technology. A second application is in the financial world. And most of you who are financial or CFOs have run into this problem or have this problem, actually. Uh, friends of ours at AIG and a few others, and not to, they're not the only ones. Uh, actually, we have most of them are in the same boat. We have the holding company and we have the corporate books. And every quarter, they have to consolidate these books upwards, 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 so that they can issue a report either to the stockholders, board of directors, the IRS, any number of uh, entities. And anyone who works in this area can tell you it is a nightmare. We can automate this process and roll up everything automatically to alleviate, alleviate this problem. We don't have to deal, you know, we take this problem literally and, and remove it from the equation. Now, that's some of our clients, Shire, that we're presently working with. Um, this is one of our clients, which we're very proud of, is the compliance at Emory University, Patty Ollinger. And that is her comment, not ours. The capabilities are amazing, years ahead of anything else. And some of our partners, and then, of course, us. Now, that being said, I'm going to show you a little bit of the world we live in physically, so that you'll see I'm not exaggerating. This is what we call our CMAP, or we, you can download this tool for free. I thought I turned you off. My apologies for that. Um, as you can see, this is an object-oriented map. No, it is not a document-based system. No, it is not a graph-based system. No, it's not mumps. It is literally object-oriented to its core. There are no rows. There are no columns. There is nothing related to it. It is strictly each object is independent. So if I wanted to, I can add to the model anywhere I want. If I don't like it there, I can put it here. It doesn't affect the rest of the model. Hence, as we discussed earlier, what you buy the first time, what you build the first time, doesn't get modified. Your code continues to work. Your programs continue to work. You simply can add to it. Now, this was built from CMAP, and what we basically do, and normally this is what we call metadata or the schema design, right? And going forward, this is our interface, manage it. Um, as you can see, we basically, we export this model to a CSL file, which you've already done here, all right? And you will see it's exactly the same. Now this is a mod product I'm going to call model. Now as you can see, this database is now fully functional. I can now program against it. I can now enter data against it. I don't have anything else to do. If I wish to add here, uh, add another concept, I can. It will become associated with this model. If I wish to add another one and create another model, I can, again. So as you can see, it's, it's amazingly quick. Now, here's where it becomes a great deal of fun. We are going to add, as we can understand, there's five different data sources. Yes, there are five files, but it's five CSV files. But as you can see, I've added all five. Now, if I want to, I can also uh, add 
uh, access Oracle, anything I have in access. Now I grab everything that's related to access I can. Done. Now it's an access. Now I have access to the access database. I can do the same thing with SQL with Oracle. Uh, as I said, if we wanted to, we have Excel, SQL, Microsoft, DB2. It'll present itself exactly the same way. Now, that being the case. If we go back to customer table, we are now going to map this data. As you can see, it mapped itself. Let me make this bigger so everybody can see. It mapped itself. City went to city. Now, please understand, that doesn't mean that I'm restricted from doing something foolish. I can do that if I wish. It doesn't have to be the same name. I can map any source to any column that I create to my model. All right. We'll do the same thing here, and this is when it becomes fun. What you're going to see here is a customer data and customer customer ID and customer ID marry themselves automatically. I didn't do anything, but if I wanted to, I could have dragged it over. Now again, we've added another source. Now, as you can see, product ID, product ID married to, again, completely separate data sources. We also have customer ID, product category, also married itself, again, two different data sources. So we have four different data sources married on the same table. Or in the same view, if you will. And as you can see, region ID, region ID married itself as well. Now, when we go to concepts, now, here's the interesting part. I can actually identify my sources and connect them accordingly. And it tells me where they're related, how they're connected, if, I have, if that's something I want to work with. Now, when we deal with, the con with our project model, you'll see there's no data. It's all zeros. Now, if we go back to our original table, we simply import the data source. Concept, now, what we'll see here is it's single instance. Single copy. There'll never be a duplicate of Barcelona, Beijing throughout the entire installation. Not just the system, the entire installation. There will only be one. And it's simply associated as many times as I needed to. I'll repeat that process. Now I have to do this uh, because of this interface, or this management interface, but it's more for demonstration and desktop purposes. But if we were doing this programmatically, you can do them simultaneously. Uh, whether it's 10 or 100 or 1,000. Now, as you'll see here, all of our data has been entered. I open them all, and here is where we have aggregated data. I simply select Beijing, and I can drill down from any direction that I wish. I can go anywhere I want from any data set. It doesn't matter from where I go. I can filter if I choose to, That's if that's what is necessary. And then this is just for a quick view, a quick verification or cleaning data, essentially. Uh, it doesn't matter what field I pick. And by the way, the performance that you're seeing here doesn't matter if it's one record, one billion records, one trillion records. It's the same. I have four reads. To explain that a little bit clearer, uh, explore. This is our manage. This is another one of our management tools where we dig into uh, if we have issues. Now, as you can see, we have our model system project, which corresponds, and you will see that there's a four key code. Whether I have department has this code, division has this code, et cetera, et cetera. Source system, even they have their code. Everything is a four key code. Every table, every source of data, expression system, everything is its own code. Now, that's the index 
for that and there's a customer ID and the items have their own code so as you can see I am no more no matter what how much data I have I have one read two I have the environment read environment the model the um, concept and then the item itself it doesn't matter and I can connect anything to anything so that being said like as I said we can do anywhere anything that you want at will aggregate data from multiple sources and you will know immediately if it's right or wrong if I want to go here it doesn't matter there's nothing in region 4 it's in the uh, no sales now as far as extorting records we can uh, select anything we want we'll select country we'll select China and basically it spits out everything about China everything that's been done with China now it doesn't when you export into this format it exports into a CSV file and you will have the results and you can use it for reports at will but you can come on you can filter more uh, city so you have Beijing you can filter at will instead of Beijing Hong Kong anything that you wish to know and I, I keep in mind ladies and gentlemen what I'm doing here is without writing a single line of code and you've seen I've not write I've not written one line of code I have not done anything that you wouldn't be able to do in Excel that's what's at your disposal today and unlimited scalability, unlimited performance, and the ease of use. So, as you can see, we're, by definition, we're a built we're a built-in warehouse. We can build, we can consolidate data at will in any quantity, in any type. Now, the interesting thing is, if you wish to create expressions, for example, we generally do. Uh, let me see, sale uh, quantity, no order ID. Let's call it order. This is as close to uh, stored procedures. So, in your code, if you wish to have or or some form of algorithms that you wish to create, you can and refer to them. They will have their object, uh, their reference ID as well. Uh, let's assume we're going to divide it by sales. Divide. And, well, it's infinity. Uh, not, a, not a good. Uh... No, let me remove that. Price. Maybe that works. Yes. Uh, as you can see, I get a result: one point nine three divided. It's not a. A pretty algorithm but essentially you can add more if it makes sense uh, you can we by definition only have these uh, functions these basic functions for this interface but our PHP but our programming interface has a complete scientific calculator so if necessary to put in logarithms or etc you can um, programmically this is just for basic usage and creating simple uh, results for most 90% of the people, 95% of the people using this, this is all they require. Uh, the more advanced systems, algorithms, you can create as many as you want and refer to them in your code. They will be pre-compiled and predefined, so the results are straightforward. Now, that's our desktop interface. I also have, which we use for large corporations, our um, web interface. Now, as you can see, we run MySQL Apache here as well. This is an entirely PHP interface. Now, as you can see, this is exactly the same solution that we were working on before uh, on the desktop. This is just on a server. One of the advantages here is uh, I get to demonstrate, for example, we have project, which again, you'll see the Nexus. That's our tables, our concepts that we mentioned before. This is our source table. And we actually aggregate all of that. Now, we've done this with 
uh, one product that we're working with is horse racing for a client. We took six different tables, essentially, as source tables. And as you can see, there's about 400,000 records here. Not a great deal, but um, still substantial. We can go as far as we want, whatever set that we want, at will. Now, the interesting thing that we were able to do with our system that nobody else can do is what we call bridging. Now, these six data sources, this one here, all right, basically has, they have the same uh, fields, if you will, track code, date, race, etc., date, unique flag, across all six data sets. Now, we can, we created what's called a race bridge, which allows us to bridge all six data sources. So, programmically, we can refer to the model itself, this, individually, and the data that's associated with it, or we could refer to the entire data through this bridge. We can so we can combine data from field one and data from field from data from table one and data from table six and data from table three and create our own world. You can mix and match as you will. Now again here jam demo. This is again the same data set. Uh, we're going to select China again. Again programmically. Uh, let's go, and there's our result set. Now, this is a multi-dimensional array. Um, you can consolidate this to look any way you want. We simply broke it up to demonstrate uh, that we can pull data from all different sources, combine them if you wish. Uh, this is a display issue here. Let me see if we have anything there. No. Uh, we can go to Switzerland. Ah, as I said, uh, you can pull data from anything and at will. And if I wanted to add another field, another country, I can. Um, but as you can see, the capability is enormous. So whether we're and you can build your own models, as I was starting to here, and then add to it at will as well. We brought in the North Winds database and its concepts. So if we wanted to do that, again, you can basically accomplish anything that you want. There's no restrictions. All right. Uh, that's about it for the demo for now. Um, I'm going to see if I can, if anybody has any questions. Uh, let me see if I can unmute this. I've, uh, does anyone have any questions? Hello? Has anyone any questions?